very much, Bruce, and good evening, everyone, from a, a rather a windy and wet Scotland, um, waiting for the next storm to come along, hopefully in the next few hours and blow us away. So uh, anyway, what I'm going to talk about for the next 45 minutes or so is this condition, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, as it occurs predominantly in the dog and predominantly in the West Highland White Terrier. And if there was one actual take-home message from this presentation, it's probably that idea that Westies that have crackling lungs probably have IPF. It's as simple as that. And a lot of practitioners tell us they see these cases in practice, uh, they're able to diagnose them, uh, but they'd probably like to know a little bit more about the accuracy of their diagnosis and what treatments are currently available or what might be in the pipeline. So tonight I'm going to go through the disease and talk a little bit about the comparative aspects with, from the human side because we do learn an awful lot about this disease from how it affects uh, people. So when you're going to compare human and veterinary IPF, obviously you have to think in terms of well, what are you comparing. So for example, we have to remember dogs are not small people and cats are not small dogs. And as a veterinary disease, it is intrinsically important in its own right. It's, it's got comparative interest, but it's a clearly a very important veterinary disease. So in terms of looking at the human side and comparing to the veterinary side, we're interested in the clinical features, the diagnostic features, uh, items of pathology, the response to treatment, and they're obviously the key uh, uh, clinical features we're interested in. Uh, the evidence to support comparison comes from peer-reviewed published papers which will fit, fit in with the items that I've listed above. And then there's obviously a big interest in, in uh, what are known as omics technologies, this idea that we can look in intense detail at what's going on in effectively a, a, what looks like an inherited disease in Westies, but also looking at what's happening at the tissue level and what's happening in the circulation. But more of that later. But what can we learn from the human side? Well, we definitely can learn to improve our diagnostic accuracy. That is without, without a case uh, a definite advantage. Uh, we're allowed or able to piggyback on the therapeutic options that are being developed for this disease in humans. Uh, and also we can get a lot more information from the human side in terms of predicting outcome and predicting prognosis of the disease. So what about the human diseases? It's very interesting if you look at the disease that occur in humans, and they're often referred to as idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, and there is a vast array of these diseases. So this slide looks rather uh, fussy, but don't be too worried about that. I'll talk my way through it and explain what, what we're looking at here. What we have to remember in human interstitial pneumonias that there are a vast number of the conditions. I mean, they vary from the, the bizarre, such as crack cocaine usage, to uh, silicosis lung, to lots of environmental and uh, occupational disease, etc. But within that fits this uh, disease known as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And there are subclassifications of that disease, which are now being transferred over into our understanding of the disease in dogs and cats. So the first one I want to draw your attention to, and this is we think is important in the dog, is this condition known as non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. So it has this heterogeneous presentation with some of these individuals progressing to what's called true IPF. Now, the best way to identify this in human patients is using high-resolution computer tomography, HRCT, and you get these kind of changes occurring. And again, I'll talk about this in a little more detail when we talk about diagnosis in the dog, but look out for when I describe features such as ground glass opacities, traction bronchiectasis, uh, and what's called subpleural sparing, and again, I'll go through that later on. As far as the pathology of NSIP is concerned, you get this diffuse alveolar wall thickening with uniform fibrosis, and you don't get any honeycombing, and you don't get what are called fibrotic foci. Now, from a pathologist's perspective, what this means is that technically speaking, it is not IPF, as is understood in the human field, but you get mild interstitial inflammation in these individuals. So as far as the um, human side is concerned, usual interstitial pneumonitis, or UIP, is regarded as the true form of IPF, or at least that's what they think. It's quite interesting to talk to uh, colleagues in the medical field how even now they're beginning to doubt their own classification system. What's interesting about the HRCT findings in these individuals is that they have minimal ground glass opacity and they have fibroblastic foci on uh, pathology. So to date, there's been no clear evidence to show that there are fibroblastic foci in the lungs of dogs with this disease, but there are in the lungs of cats. So just, again, bear that in mind. The cat and the dog disease seem to be different from a pathological perspective. The ones I've listed at the bottom, again, just make up the list, the desquamative interstitial pneumonitis, and then the
condition called pluriparenchymal fibroelastosis, or PPFE, is actually a disease of the donkey, uh, and not, to my knowledge, actually seen in dogs or cats. And then there are other very rare and unclassified forms of IIPs, which we don't really need to worry about. So when we talk about domestic animals and the IIPs they suffer from, we're primarily talking about this broad category of IPF, however we want to define that. So in the dog, we see a sporadic, fairly breed specific, pretty much the West Highland White Terrier, relatively common in that breed, but obviously not a, not a very common disease in the general scheme of things. You may pick it up in other breeds, such as the Cairn Terrier, and there are reports of it being picked up in other terrier-type breeds, but the Westie seems to predominate in the animals that are affected with this condition. Currently, the thinking would be that it's likely to be non-specific interstitial pneumonitis these dogs have, plus or minus the usual interstitial pneumonitis or the true form of IPF. So if we were to be pedantic about this, it probably would be wise to say, well, they don't actually have IPF, but as far as the veterinary side is concerned, we will just call it IPF for, for the sake of clarity. The feline form of the disease, which I won't talk about in any great detail because it's, there's not an awful lot known about it, but what's very interesting about the cat form of the disease is that it looks just like human UIP. So if the medics were interested in a naturally occurring model of IPF, then actually it's the cat disease, not the dog disease, that they should look at. And then, of course, there's this asinine or donkey form of the disease, possibly related to asinine herpes virus. So any of you who are interested in uh, equine work, similarly you get an EHV5 associated disease in horses. Uh, and again, they're just, just of interest and not necessarily something we'll go through tonight. So just some pictures to show you what uh, this condition of pluriparenchymal fibroelastosis looks like in donkeys. And you get this kind of change that occurs towards the periphery, and a lot of the lung is spared. And you'll see this in approximately 35% of geriatric donkeys actually get this disease. So it's actually quite a, a common problem in that species. But actually, PPFE in humans is extremely rare. And as I say, to my knowledge, uh, there's never been a report of it in the dog or in the cat. So we'll just push that to one side. So the cat form, as I said earlier, um, very credible that this is IPF, as we understand it in human disease, but because it's very sporadic and you don't tend to see many of these cases, it's often difficult to develop an overall impression of its clinical features, etc., and its overall, uh, the natural disease progression, etc., okay? So similar pathology to humans. Interestingly, some coexistence uh, with lung carcinomas, which is also a feature with a lot of human patients with IPF. So maybe, maybe cats are small people. Uh, but it is dissimilar to dogs. So the main, di the main differential consideration, if you think you've got feline IPF, is pulmonary TB. And there appears to be an increased prevalence and incidence of pulmonary TB occurring in cats, uh, either of microtiform or even of M. Bova. So just be aware of that. There is actually a very good pathological description of the disease by Kurt Williams. Uh, this is a picture from his, this paper published in 2007, uh, uh, where they've actually shown that the disease looks very similar to the human disease. On the right-hand side, you can see the uh, CT images from a cat with, with IPF. The main thing that jumps out from the CT images here is the appearance of honeycombing. And again, honeycombing is a characteristic feature of the disease in people. So the cat looks like it might be the human disease, but as I say, relatively rare. So how do the medics approach a disease like this? Or how do they approach these uh, interstitial pneumonias in terms of getting a diagnosis? And the reason I put up this slide is to show you how they've gone from a complicated algorithms for diagnosis down to a relatively simple plan to decide that a patient does or does not have IPF. So at the top of the slide you can see you suspected IPF. Have you got other fibrosing lung disease? Let's say a, a list of a disease the length of your arm if you're in human medicine and if it goes down that route of course it's not IPF. But look what, look what happens when they jump into the two options. One is HRCT high resolution computed tomography. And by going from, from HRCT and looking at the radiologic pattern, you see a pattern and you jump immediately down to the bottom of the slide that you have IPF. So historically, in medicine, what they would tend to do is they would go for surgical lung biopsy after they'd done your CT, and then they'd get a sample, and they'd check the histology, and then they'd make a diagnosis of IPF. But if you look what's happening, they're actually cutting out the surgical lung biopsy approach. They're getting to a stage where they're confident to go straight from the imaging 
information straight to a disease diagnosis. Now, there's various reasons for doing that and various beneficial reasons.